I am honored this afternoon to introduce both Susan Call, author of Real Life and Other Fictions, and Andrew Yule, author of Set for Life, as well as the moderator of this session, Taylor Burney. Real Life and Other Fictions is Susan's seventh novel. The others include Bookish People and Acceptance, which has been made into a television movie starring Joan Cusack. Her work has appeared in numerous publications. She is the president of the Penn Faulkner Foundation, the events advisor for Politics and Prose, the bookstore, and Newsday has described her as the queen of literary comedy. Set for Life is Andrew's first book, first novel, following stories and essays in many publications after spending his early years on a sailboat in the Caribbean, which sounds really awesome. He is the recipient of fellowships from Yado, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and the Moulin Neff Studio Center in Olvillar, France, and I hope I didn't butcher those names. I found both of these novels delightful, and they both involve similar themes on the quest for great literary achievement. The main characters in both books are teachers of writing, have aspirations to write the great American novel, are dealing with failing relationships and working through new chapters amid the typical crises of extraordinary lives. My favorite description of real life and other fictions, a kooky treasure rooted in the deeply literary, slightly askew interior world that makes this author's work so fine. And Set for Life has been described as a gem of a debut and a hilarious and poignant tour de force that brings new meaning to the phrase, publish or perish. So you can tell this is going to be a great discussion. <clears throat> Our moderator this afternoon is Taylor Burney, who is currently the Director of Network Programming and Production at, N at NPR. She describes herself as an innovator who is always looking for new ways to accomplish goals and forge partnerships. She also reviews books for the Washington Post and the Washington Independent Review of Books, and she says that some she liked, some she loved, and some, well, dot, 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 didn't. <laughs> so we'll see where she comes out with these, th we, these two. So please join me in welcoming Susan Call, Andrew Yule, and Taylor Burney. Thank you so much for that excellent introduction. Um, and I loved these for the record. Both of these are excellent <laughs> books. You should all buy them. And I, I do just want to say thank you all so much for coming out today. It is damp, to say the least. And readers, look, I know on a Saturday when it's raining, I'm like, let me just crawl into bed, stay here with a book. So shout out to all of you for being here, um, because we know that's also an appealing option. But you're here, which is much better, um, in community with your fellow readers and authors and supporting local independent bookstores. Stop by that PMP. Uh, shop on your way out. We will leave time for your questions as well, so please do think of what you might want to ask. It always comes up quicker than you think it will. Um, and Andrew, Susan, we just got a little bit of a tease on your books, but I would love if you could help just like go one layer deeper on each of yours for those in the audience who might not have yet picked it up, read about it. Um, Andrew, we'll start with you. Can you just give a little more of the dust jacket dive on, on what Set for Life is about? Sure, sure. Um, the broad gist is it's about a creative writing teacher at a third tier college in the throes of a midlife crisis. Um, we meet him as he's coming home from a three month fellowship abroad where he's supposed to have written the novel that will get him tenure, but he's done nothing. It's a total waste of the summer. And he soon begins an affair with his wife's best friend who's also his best friend's wife. It's a comedy. <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, he thinks for a moment this might be just the thing he needs to spark his creativity to get back on the right track. But of course, it's a novel, and so it's the very thing that starts him down this path of misadventure towards rock bottom. Yes, there is misadventure. There's rock bottom, but there's a bit of redemption, I believe, at the end, which we'll, we'll get to later. Um, and Susan, if you could do the same, just share a little bit more about the perhaps different hijinks, but still hijinks in your novel. Sure. Um, this novel was inspired 
by and is largely about a bridge collapse, a real life bridge collapse in 1967 in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. And that sort of spawned the legend of the Mothman in the year or so before the bridge collapsed. There were multiple sightings in the area of this giant creature, part man, part moth, that was thought to be more of a harbinger of disaster. It wasn't an, a bad force in and of itself. Um, so I've, I heard about that story uh, a while ago, like more than 15 years or so ago, and it stuck with me. And it was made into a feature film in 2002 with Richard Gere and Laura Linney, but that took it in a more horror direction. And what I was always interested in was more the the story of survival. So I've written from the point of view of someone who was orphaned in the bridge collapse. And believe it or not, this is also a comedy, so it might not sound like one, but uh, I will get into that more, I'm sure, as yeah. we talk. No, it, both books are very funny, despite their sometimes dark uh, subject matter. And Susan, if you can, please, or if you would, please, for us, read from the very beginning, because sure. this novel starts on a different bridge that we assure you is not collapsing, but I think it's a familiar setting to many of the folks in the audience. Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, this chapter is called The Incident on the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. So, a heavy gray slush begins to fall from the sky and the windshield wipers turn themselves on, startling me. Although the car is seven years old, it is new to me and I'm still getting used to its high-tech features, many of which are already obsolete. It has none of the self-driving technology one reads about, for example, so it's entirely on me to stomp on the brakes to avoid hitting the car ahead as traffic comes to an abrupt stop. The vehicle with which I merci mercifully do not plow into is a green Honda CRV with University of Virginia sticker affixed to the top right corner of the windshield. The speed at which I'm traveling is precisely one mile under the 50 mile per hour speed limit. I lock into these details because I am the sort of law abiding to a fault motorist who minds the rules of the road, always staying at or below the speed limit. And because my daughter, Vera, has only a few days ago completed her first semester at the University of Maryland. In front of me is presumably another student or former student or the parent of a student or an instructor or someone student adjacent in one form or another, albeit at a pub different public institution of higher learning. But also I lock into these details as a way to ground myself. I'm feeling light without anchor as if I might unbuckle my seatbelt and crack the window and slip through the slit like a puff of steam or a whiff of smoke. It's not simply that my daughter is away for the holidays for the first time in 19 years. I've also just left my husband. I've brought to conclusion a long, painful stalemate, taken my poorly behaved puppy, and walked out the door. No harsh words were exchanged, although I had half hoped for a provocation, or at least some display of emotion, when I told him I was leaving, that I was headed to my aunt and uncle's house on the Delaware shore. We were meant to go together. It was our family's long-standing tradition to spend the week between Christmas and New Year's at the beach, and I confess there was still a piece of me that hoped he would protest, that he would apologize and suggest we sort things out, bundle up and take some long walks along the sea, and clarify our situation, maybe find a new way to start. Uh, instead, he replied only with a warning, the last place you want to be in a weather event is on the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. Richard and I have been idling in an indeterminate state for some time now and have more recently begun to trend in the direction of collapse. After a series of problems with which he has refused to engage, first professional, then personal, Richard moved into the basement where he now works and sleeps. This morning, as I departed, I told him I couldn't live like this anymore, but what precisely I hope to achieve, I can't say for sure. I suppose I would have welcomed any sort of reaction, anger included. At least it might have moved us toward the next place, whatever that might have been. But my formerly dynamic, rabble-rousing, storm-chasing, meteorologist husband has imploded on so many different, spectacularly painful levels that there's little left of him or of us. 
He's like a star that has collapsed under its own gravity, a black hole, a closed presence that spends most of its time and space crafting copy for the newspaper's weather desk, staring at a bank of screens. That's the first time I've read from this book. This is my first event, so that was Thank strange. You. Thank you for doing it um, and indulging me. And you know, it, th as you know, it, there is th the scene gets hilarious and both hilarious and terrifying from that point on um, because there's a bit of a, a chase on the bridge with her dog. It's a whole scene. Um, but you know, you mentioned you were inspired by the literal collapse of a bridge, and. As we meet Cassie, her her life is collapsing in some ways, right? Her marriage is coming apart, um, and she is seeking some truths, right? Because she was orphaned in that collapse, and she her family hasn't really talked to her about it. So, was it important for you to sort of find her at a moment where her entire life is in flux, um, and, and what sort of inspired that place where we meet her um, to kind of overlap with her search for the truth of, of how her life kind of collapsed the first time, right? Yeah, I mean, a few, a few paragraphs later from uh, where I stopped reading, we learn uh, the, the traffic is stopped on the bridge, her, and there's a moth in the car, and I've already mentioned the moth man situation that has haunted her her whole life, so it, it becomes it becomes very dramatic. Uh, there's an accident on the bridge and all sorts of things uh, unfold from there. So I, I did want to start it on a bridge, on a different bridge. I wanted to start it with a moth. I wanted, you know, I went back and forth about whether to tell the reader right away that her parents had died in this bridge collapse, but I decided to just lean into that uh, right away. And I, I really struggled with the opening of this book, though. I showed it to my uh, I teach, or I'm not teaching right now, but I taught for many years a long intensive novel workshop and I see a couple of my students here and I showed them this chapter and they were like, you're teaching us writing? <laughs> like, this is a terrible chapter, but they, you know, just getting that reaction helped me better understand how to, how to begin the book. So yeah, I want to start right, That's right so with the action. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I mean, it's an, it is an, I, it's a visceral opening. And I think especially for people who've driven across the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, which is like a whole experience. Um, we're going to talk about endings in a minute. So thank you for talking about beginnings. Um, forward promote to the ending conversation in a minute. But, you know, Andrew, speaking of teaching writing and both of you write about writing and, and teaching writing in your novels. And your main character, as, as you sort of have mentioned, is at this crossroads when we meet him, right? Like he's just spent the summer in France. Like he didn't achieve nothing. He drank a lot and he ate a lot of good snacks. Um, but he has not done any writing per se um, because he doesn't really know what to write about. Can you actually can I bother you to read as well from the start of, of your novel, a passage where he's kind of debating with those really good friends you mentioned who he ends up having an affair with one of? Um, yeah, I think all you need to... The only setup you need here is um, the narrator's just come back from this disastrous summer. I guess he did a, he learned some French he curse words. He had some good drinks, y'all. Yeah, he had some I mean, good drinks. He had good wine. It's great. It's not a loss. Um, and now he's in Brooklyn having dinner with uh, some old friends from graduate school. Friends of him and his wife. Uh, I guess it should be noted also his wife happens to be a best selling novelist herself. While he's struggling, she's, you know, pumping him out. So, okay. The entrees soon arrived, and after a few forkfuls of spaghetti bolognese, John turned to me and said, what are you trying to write about anyway? That same old stuff about boat yards and boarding houses, fishing trawlers and whatnot? I grew up in Big Pine Key, Florida, in a dilapidated two-story motel called The Last Resort, which my father won in a poker game and spent the rest of his life failing to make profitable. Though I hadn't been back in more than 15 years, the place was crystallized in my mind. The steel blue travel lift hauling sailboats back and forth across the asphalt lot, the curdled odor of bilge waste and diesel smoke in the salt air, the piggish grunt of cormorants taking flight from the bollards each morning, my father's white panel van parked forever by the lobby door, its sides painted over with the names of aborted business ventures like a palimpsest of failed ambitions. It was all I'd written about in graduate school, that place, those people, 
I had even penned a novel by that name. But over the years, I grew embarrassed of the place, and probably it showed in my work. When my agent tried to sell the novel, the editors mostly agreed it was too parochial, too, uh, too parochial, not relatable enough. So I took a cue from Deborah's playbook and went to France in search of something, anything else to write about. Nobody wants to read that stuff anymore, I told John. And besides, a guy like me relating his sad life story, it's unbecoming. Like wearing the band's t-shirt at the concert, there are some things you just don't do. <laughs> Perhaps you should set your sights on something more topical then, John suggested. He reached across the table for the bread and tore off a piece, dipping it in the sauce on his plate. Have you considered right-wing extremism, he offered, chewing, <laughs> or global warming? I stabbed a piece of asabuco and pushed it around the plate. I don't think I'm qualified to tackle those subjects. Something to do with a cult, then, or a young person with supernatural powers, or perhaps an apocalypse. Apocalypse are very popular. <laughs> Thank you so much for reading that for us. Um, you know, I, I do think that struggle of what to write is is very real. And I never want to ask if a book is about an author because I think that's like too facile, like that's too simple a thing to think about. But I, I do wonder how you thought about incorporating your experience as a teacher, as a writer into this work that is about doing those things and, and how you think about the business even, right? Um, as As we hear in that, that passage because it's like what what is interesting to you as the author may or may not resonate with an audience so how how did you navigate that both for yourself as a writer and in writing about it in the novel to just tank to write a tangle of a question for you and yeah, ask yeah. you to good question it. good Thanks. job i mean eh, i've done better i'll workshop the next one okay um well it's I mean, to give some of the context of the book, the, as I said, the narrator is married to mm -hmm. a much more successful novelist. Mm -hmm. And she seems to be able to tap into the zeitgeist and write whatever's fashionable and get it out there. And so plot-wise, I mean, the journey that I wanted to take this guy on is from this place where he's kind of scrabbling about for the fashionable literary item. Uh, and take him towards where he can figure out um, the story he actually kind of needs to tell rather than what he thinks someone else wants him mm -hmm. to tell. Um, you know, I will say, I think that it's... You can sometimes get lost in thinking about what other writers are up to, and it's mm -hmm. a bad habit, and it's not useful for making art, and the more you can get that stuff out of your head and not care what anybody thinks of it and maybe even pretend that no one's gonna read it and nobody gives a shit. And <laughs> then you start to be on to something, which is to say you start to get closer to sounding like yourself, telling the stories that matter to you, and then the best you can hope for is someone else out there thinks it's okay. Yeah, no, that's real. I mean, I think that we were talking before coming out here about the difference between sitting by yourself writing, and then, first of all, putting it out to the public and, and losing control of, of it in many ways at that point, and then also having to talk to people about it, which is yeah. like a whole other thing, which, Susan, you're very familiar with, both for yourself and in the work you do um, with author events. And I, I wonder, in each of these books, there's a really beautiful element of like the power of stories, right? Like There's almost like a meditation on what, how they make us who we are, right? And the importance of having the ability to tell a narrative that is true in some way, even if it is through fiction. Um, and I, I do wonder, um, from each of you, and Susan, we'll start with you, whether that was something you set out intentionally to do in the novel, or if that's something that emerged as you were writing. Yeah, I think it emerged as I was writing, and yet it really is what's at the core of this novel in so many different ways, but this woman, the main character, has this amazing family story that she doesn't really know what it is. No one in her family will talk to her about it, including her aunt who raised her, who has a successful podcast on NPR called The Storyteller. She won't talk, she won't tell this story either. So she's got her own unfinished story, but then 
really the only, I think, the only truly autobiographical piece of this is about my experience as a writing teacher for all of these years. I mean, I've been teaching writing for about 20 years. And I have, I think it's true that I have every single story I've ever read from my students in my head. And what do you do with that, right? Because I've never, you know, some of them were intro classes, so I only saw the beginnings of these stories. Some are novels in progress, but I realize I'm just walking around with, like, there's certain protagonists just, like, left in near-death situations. So, um, so I wanted to get it at that, just at the whole story story of stories. So. You, you give that to Cassie in a, in a very beautiful way, I thought, because you you have her sort of not just tell you once that that's something she thinks about, right, as a, as a teacher and as someone who has heard the beginning of a lot of stories and not necessarily known either the end or just the next chapter of that story for her students, right? Um, and you don't just say it once. Like, she, she very subtly goes back more than once and revisits those stories. So you can tell it's something that she really meditates on and that she thinks about that. Um, and, and again, is in pursuit of the next chapter and or a true understanding of her own story as well. Right, right. Um, it's really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and, you know, Andrew, you just mentioned, like, it is important to find that story you need to tell, right? And, and the story you're telling here is about writers. Um, so I, I wonder, similar question to you, like, that idea of stories and, and your main character ends up thinking about taking someone else's story. I don't think it's a spoiler to say that. We won't say whose or, or details on it, but it, he, he thinks about taking someone else's story and, and kind of making it his own. And I, I wonder why you decided to have him do that um, to some extent, because I think it is sometimes compelling to think about you know, oh, that's a really interesting story. I want to tell that story, but it's not necessarily yours to tell. So I, I wonder if you can just kind of expand on that idea of like the story that you need to tell and what stories you have the right to tell. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the book centers on four people, two relationships or three relationships among four people or uh, something like that. Anyway, uh, they're all writers. And uh, at one point in the book, the narrator discovers that his wife has been writing a book mined from his, from details of his own life and uh, his emails and phone calls and things like that. Um, I, so anyway, I mean, so I guess I would say yeah. I'm interested, or I was interested, I guess I still am, in, uh, in what the ethics are surrounding what happens with stories that are drawn from a shared set of experiences from the private lives of people who have common overlapping, uh, who have relationships together, who, who were perhaps present for the same things. Um, it's sort of a, you know, it's kind of an in-joke that happens sometimes among writers. It's like, are you gonna take that or can I have it, you know? And I sort of wanted to take that as far as I could. Yeah. Well, and in this circumstance, too, it's, it is, I don't think it's a spoiler to say it's about the dissolution of, it's about the sort of crumbling of, of their relationship in many ways, because as you've said, he's having an affair, um, you know, and, and she is picking up on some of those messages and, and incorporating that into her work. And she seems very, like, she's like a magpie in her writing, as you said. She's kind of pulling from the zeitgeist. She's watching Law and Order while she's writing. She's, like, talking to her sister on the phone. She's, like, pulling from everywhere. Um, but there is this affair at the center of, of actually both of your novels in some ways. And I, in, in each of them, it was so interesting to me that they're with people who are very close to their lives, to their relationships, to their families. Um, and I, I wonder, I mean, as you just said, like that experience of having sort of a shared narrative, um, did you set out to have that be the case um, as you were starting to think about plotting this out, that it had to be someone who was close to them? Yeah, I mean, that's that was what I had in mind, and I think that's the way it often works. Yeah. And it's also, you know, kind of the closer to home you can make the problem, the central conflict, the, the more is at stake. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of those things were were uh, planned from the sure. outset. Um, 
And I think it's also, as I said before, I was also interested, it's, it's important that these betrayals be taking place among writers who also have 20 years of a lot of the same stories between them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, the dynamics between everybody and whether and how their relationships continue forward over the course of the novel is, is really interesting and, and you explore it in a fascinating way because it, it does make it more interesting. I think a lot of times when you read affairs, it's like some stranger and it's like, as you noted, in real life, that's probably not the case. Um, and Susan, similar question to you. I mean, it, it, it is um, also, y'all, you have to read the book because I'm not going to spoil the scene for you, but the way, the way Cassie finds out about it is both hilarious and heartbreaking. Thank you. Um, yeah, I yeah. wanted to get it you know, similarly to like, what is the worst sort of insult? And it's not the stranger, it's someone who is a very close family friend and has therefore been in the house, been, you know, one with family events at Thanksgiving dinners, just sort of, you know, part of the fabric of, of life. And then to learn that this is going on seems like the, you know, the worst way to, to describe that, but also, um, and I won't give away what Taylor's referring to, but I wanted to think like, what is the absolute worst sort of insult that this, this very familiar mundane item is left behind, which is almost worse than like sexy underwear mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. because it's worse. It's, right, um, because it just shows a complete disregard for, uh, mm -hmm. for the whole situation. Yeah, no, it's brilliant and it's, it, it's you cringe and also laugh like it's well done because it, it is um, as you said the, mon the, the almost the horror of the mundane in the moment um, is very visceral. Um, Susan, you mentioned that you were inspired by this actual bridge collapse, right? And and Cassie is she has one book that she has read and like had to hide from her aunt, <laughs> the storyteller who won't tell her what happened. Um, did you find a lot of sources when you were looking into it? I mean, it, it seemed. As, as yeah. Cassie experiences it, there's not much to be found. Yeah, I mean, I'd first heard about this bridge collapse and the story of the Mothman from uh, another bookseller at, uh, mm -hmm. at Politics and Prose, although he now denies knowing anything about it. So that's as mysterious as everything else about <laughs> the legend of the Mothman. But when he told me about it, um, which I think he did, I was so intrigued that I that the next weekend I went by myself, which is not something I usually do. I just got in my car, I drove six hours to West Virginia, I went to this festival that they have every fall, the Mothman Festival, and at, there's a Mothman Museum, and in the museum, which I have in the book, there's a whole archive in the back of newspaper articles mm. and um, memorabilia about the bridge collapse, which was really tragic. It's the worst a bridge collapse in modern history. And when this Baltimore bridge collapsed, seeing the headlines yeah. in the paper was almost exactly the same sorts of headlines, except that there were far fewer fatalities um, because they could, they stopped the traffic, thank goodness. But, um, so there are a few books written on it. I, I refer in the, no in the novel to a book called The Silver Bridge Disaster, mm -hmm. which I have. But then when they made this movie, The Mothman Prophecies, that was based off a couple of sort of supernatural slash horror takes on the story, but those had a lot of information. But other than that, there's not a lot of, you know, there's a lot of Wikipedia mm -hmm. stuff and there's a lot of weird stuff on the internet about it. No but, way. Yeah. <laughs> so unusual to find weird things. Like yeah. That. Yeah. Um, yeah, I imagine it was both tempting to like keep going down that rabbit hole and at a certain point yeah, you have to you have to be careful because it yeah. goes into I mean the the story yeah. again I get it a little bit of this in the book yeah. but there's there's the facts and then there's the theories of mm -hmm. what is this mothman which has been seen before other sure. disasters uh, apparent supposedly uh, before Chernobyl for instance um, but then there's like alien theories, there's government conspiracy theories, there's, there's so many rabbit holes. Yeah, 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 tons of rabbit holes to go down. Um, Andrew, in, in writing about academia, right, you've taught, you have inhabited that world a bit, like, did you feel like you were drawing from experience? Did you do any research and, and think about, because I, I find academia, like, as someone who is not, I'm like, it's a different language um, in some ways and just like a very, set and prescribed, again, you mentioned you, 
your your uh, main character is trying to get tenure at the start, right? And I think that is a world that if you don't inhabit it, you're like, how does that work? Um, so I, I'm curious if you felt like you had to like s bring people along as part of that, and how much detail to include, and how, where to pull back a little. Yeah, I mean, in terms of bringing people along, I didn't think about it at all. Yeah. Great. I, I I hope they go along with it, but. Um, no, I mean, I before I wrote this book, uh, or sort of the the reason I wrote this book, I had mm -hmm. recently left a tenure track teaching position. I was feeling kind of uh, fed up with a lot of the stuff, and had uh, and I felt like I wanted to say yeah. something about yeah. it. Um, and you know, I mean, there's a saying about academic novels, right? They have to be comedies because the stakes are so low. Uh, I mean, what goes on in an, in an English department in college is stupid. It doesn't, if it really doesn't affect the real world, but everyone inside of it is so self-important. It's very dramatic. Though, yes, right? everything is so dramatic and oh my God. So that's just, um, I mean, so the tone was kind of handed over to me because that's how I saw it. Um, you know, I will say I always kind of felt like I entered that world through the side entrance um, as a writer. You know, not an academic, not a not a mm -hmm. scholar, and so I think I do think I had the advantage of kind of always being a fly on the wall to a a strange and insular environment. Uh, that certainly comes through in the writing because I. You know, again, I'm like, that's a world I know like the, this much about, and and I think it has that sense of being someone who is in it but not of it. Um, so it, it's well executed in that sense, and and there are the stakes feel very high. It's like gossip, right? When you're like, this is gossip that does not concern me, and I love it. Um, you know, like there's these people whose lives are like very focused on this goal they're working towards or this cocktail party that they're going to be at and, and prioritizing that above everything else. And I'm like, go on, tell me the gossip. Um, you know, tell me which professor is having their seventh kid and, you know, all these other details that come out. So it's, it is like being immersed in this community where like you don't have any stakes in it. Um, do you feel, I mean, you, you mentioned it, you wrote this at a time when you're getting out. Does it feel like, how does it feel to be out? Well, it'd be nice to have a paycheck. I mean, those so, are I mean, great. Someday. But uh, no, I mean, I think, you know, I think a lot of what I got out of writing this book is that I got to look back on a period of my own life and treat it with the arm's length mm -hmm. of fiction, and which is both a way of getting... I think closer to the truth of something that you've mm -hmm. gone through and or been around, and then you kind of you can get a handle on it. Um, so it's and there's also something about you if you write things that have anything to do with real life or any p people or places you've known, mm -hmm. and you put it in the book, you put the book out, and there's a sense of closing it and. Mm -hmm closing that chapter, sure. as it were. Yeah. So I don't know, if does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. No, I think it does. Um, and I mean, Susan, you were talking about endings before, right? And I, and I mean, you actually started talking about beginnings and how hard it was for you to begin the novel. But I always, I do not envy writers and authors when they have to end a novel, because I think it can be so hard to figure out where to leave your characters and how to bring some sort of satisfying resolution. And, and, and I'm curious if you found writing the ending, which we will not give away, um, any easier than the beginning? Yeah, endings are always hard for me. I usually get a novel almost like 80, 90% of the way there and then walk away from it and go back to try to figure out the ending. And then I'm usually sent back multiple times by my editor or my agent to, to or my husband um, to try to get the, the ending down and with this book, I I was sent back yet again at the very the very last rewrite, and there had been one small scene um, early in the book that my editor had said, you know, this is nice, but what is it doing here? And I still didn't I didn't want to cut it. And then when I got to the very mm. end, I looped back to that mm. scene, and it felt like ah that, that it clicked. So 
it's usually all in there. I tell my writing students, you know, when you can't figure out what, what to do, sure. it's already in there. You just have to go back to the beginning and, and find your sure. way through. So. Yeah. Um, we will turn it over to you all for your questions in just a minute. But I mean, Andrew, similar question for you. I mean, your ending, which we also will not give away, it gets like meta a little bit in a, in a very good and interesting way. Um, what were you kind of weighing and, and considering as you thought about how to bring this story to a close? Well, Susan, I think you, it's, it's all in there, right? Is how, you know, and I think that's a useful way of thinking of it. I mean, you get, you get far enough along and you can't, you get to a point where you can't just make up new things. You, you got to build on what's there. Um, it's a novel about a 40 something straight white writer. So there's a degree of self-awareness that had that's kind of baked into the project. Sure. So, you know, I won't give anything about the ending away, but the it's sort yeah. of it was already yeah. there. No, it, it it is it it sort of rolls out beautifully and, you know, is very satisfying at the end to kind of come to a, a place of conclusion and say, "Okay, yeah, we're good. We we're leaving everybody we're we're in a good place, right? Where you can kind of see where it's, I, I think the thing about endings too is like, you know these characters on some level are continuing past the close of the book, right? Like, not really in real life, because they're not real. But, you know, like there is a sense of, you can sort of envision where they're going after you shut the book at the final page. Yeah, I mean, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll just add, I think there's, I've always thought of endings as the very beginning mm -hmm. of a new story, right? Yeah. I mean, if you, once you kind of close that last chapter, it, it usually involves the intimation of some kind of mm -hmm. new adventure. Yes, absolutely. No, it's, it's. I mean, I think, Susan, I, I, again, what I loved about the way you had Cassie meditating on those endings is like, the story doesn't end, right? Like yeah. the story is the person who's, you know, especially in her case, as she's thinking about her students who are often writing about their own lives. Um, it's their story. Yeah. yeah, and another thing I sort of discovered with this book, and I have a little bit of reflection on it in, in the novel, is how a story sort of knows what it wants to be. And mm -hmm. there, there were so many little things with this novel that I kept changing, like the season. It started mm -hmm. in summer it seemed like a summer book but then it just was became clear it was a winter book like lots of little things like that just made themselves known to me and in, in a way that made it feel almost like it's an archaeological thing it's it already exists you just need to discover what it is as the writer so. i love that about writing um we would love to open it up to y'all for your questions mimi has a microphone and we'll run it over to you if you want to raise your hand Anybody want to be the first? Yes, ma'am. When do you write, and how often do you write? Me? <laughs> uh, when do I write? I mean, I guess I write whenever it seems like the ideas are coming. Um, that I, I mean, I can say that right now because all I'm doing is writing. But when I've had, I mean, when I've been teaching full-time and trying to write, I, you know, you sort of fit it in whenever you can. Um, what was the other part? You do it every day, every oh. week. Um, One should. <laughs> Considered best hours. practice. You know, I, want, I, want, I want to write two hours a day. I want to write 2,000 words a day. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, person, you know, the, 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 the person you're describing is the writer I would like to be. <laughs> Yeah, I think I got into the habit when my kids were very young of writing in the morning when they went off to school because that was the only time of day I had. So I've always stuck to that. And because I'm working part time in the afternoon, I, I just try to do all my writing in the morning and I try to do it every day. But it's been hard. It's been hard lately. And each each book, I find a different rhythm for it. Anybody else? Yes. This is a the, hi. This is a real technical question. Um, how, and maybe it's affect, affected by the day, but 
how would the Mothman get around with all this rain? With the rain? With the rain. <laughs> Well, that's a good question. I don't know where the Mothman is at this moment, but wherever he is, it's not, not a good thing because something bad is about to happen. So, But I don't know. I mean, it's like giant wings, He's right? Huge. He's huge. Probably moths get around in the rain. So, yeah. yeah. yeah great question. <laughs> the other questions from the crowd? Yes, ma'am. Hold it. Mew's coming over. Mike's coming to you. Okay. No, it's great. I always love to hear who inspires writers. So who are the writers who inspire the two of you? No. <laughs> um, I don't have any one answer, I, although I can say when I first started writing, uh, the British author William Boyd I found very inspiring because of his range. He wrote comic fiction, he wrote serious literary fiction, and just being able to see that you could, you know, you could cross genres I found very inspiring because I, I don't really know what genre I'm writing in. I'm, I'm just writing. But I read a lot of contemporary fiction because of my bookstore job and just find, even writing this book, I was reading Holly Gr Grazimo, Gramazio, yes. Gr I don't yes, know, the I'm husbands, forgetting, yeah, right? The Husbands, oh my God, which just it. came out, which is fantastic, <laughs> so but good. she's just such a sparkling writer, and I just found reading her sentence for sentence made me want to write better and made me go back and think, how can I make this scene better? So really, whatever I'm reading, I just absorb a little bit of, of the wisdom. Well, what about you, Andrew? I think I probably learned almost everything I know and think about writing from the vintage contemporaries uh, imprint. Uh, so, I mean, you know, I had a copy of the vintage book of contemporary American short stories, right? The American flag cover that Tobias Wolf edited. Um, and, you know, so Dennis Johnson, Richard Ford, uh, and Beatty, that, that was, you know, I sort of plowed through as much as I could, and um, and that that started it. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yep. Well, I can say it loud. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I just wanted to ask, what's a writer's worst nightmare? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Susan. Well, I think we would probably all say just like bad reviews out the gate, but I, you know, I've lived through that. It happens once in a while and we, we survive. I think that's my, my worst nightmare. Then the second one is no one buys the book or showing up, going to an event and nobody showing up. But, you know, I've lived through that too. So <laughs> you, you can get through it, through it all. I don't know. What's your worst nightmare? Yeah, I don't. I mean, that's a great question. I, the whole thing's kind of a nightmare, really. <laughs> it, it, it's there's not there aren't many other things that you do in life, and there aren't many other art forms where you have to commit to something that's probably going to take you a couple of years to complete, and you have no idea if it's going to work, and you never know, and but you do it anyway, and so there's just. It's not a it's not a nightmare exactly, but it's uh, but it's a anxiety inducing uh, practice and but you do it anyway. Um, I will say that getting a bad review is a nightmare. Reading one of Ron Charles' bad reviews <laughs> is one of the greatest <laughs> gifts a reader of the Washington Post can have. Hi, Ron. Um, just wanted to embarrass him for a hot second. Yes, sir. Yes, um, when. Dick Cavett used to have writers on as guests. One of the things he always asked them was, did they uh, suffer from the writer's curse, drinking? Now, I'm not going to ask if you, uh, you're, you know, you're alcoholics or anything like that, <laughs> but, but what I will ask, is there, I, um, is there some, uh, some part of being a writer that you find in all writers, like uh, snark or some, type, some kind of awareness that other people don't have? I mean, I could answer the Dick Cavett question and say, yeah. I mean, I mean your duh. main character, again, he achieves a lot of drinking in France, if not much writing. 
Yeah, he does throughout the whole book. The, there's he's, a lot he, of drinking. He's heroic. Um, <laughs> but, messy. you know, I mean, I think that, uh, I think that the nature of writing, the calling, whatever it is that makes mm. a person think, oh, I can look around and make observations and someone else is going to want to hear what I have to say, it's a kind of a weird psychology and it and I think it also demands that you be that you spend a lot of your life on the outskirts not in the club but on the outside of the club and I think so I don't know if you know it I don't know if that quite answers your question but it's sort of I do think it's a it, it's a strange psychological condition to be a writer yeah that's a good answer I mean as to the drinking I can tell you I am at the point where I, my brain wouldn't work anymore if I had. I'm really trying to just keep what brain cells I have uh, left. So I, I'm really sort of living a, a very healthy life right now, trying to keep it going. But, uh, you know, for me, I think it's seeing the comedy in a situation where other people don't see it. I think that's what makes me right. Like, you know, it's on the face of it, there's nothing comic about this story. And yet, even when I try to write about something that's serious, my first novel was about uh, Karl Marx's daughter who had committed suicide. And when I went to try to shop the novel, all the editors were saying, this is really funny. I was like, well, it's not supposed to be funny. So I think that's, that's the way I approach yeah. things. Yeah. I think we have time for one more. Yes. We're closing with the gentleman we started with. <laughs> so Susan. Um, I read your entire book um, thinking that you completely made up the Mothman, the Mothman Chronicles, and even the bridge disaster. And it wasn't until the, I read the acknowledgments at the end that I was, oh my gosh, this, 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 this actually happened. And so then I looked it up, I read the Wikipedia page, you know, I, I did all that stuff. And I just wondered, did you anticipate that might happen to, to your reader? Uh, that, that's really interesting to hear, especially because the book is just out. It's like not even on sale till technically till Tuesday. So this is all new hearing uh, readers' impressions. Um, I, I thought about starting, and someone suggested that I start with an epigraph that would signal that this had been a real story and a real movie. But in the end, I just decided to leave it as as fiction, but um, yeah, I, I, delib I deliberately put it in the acknowledgments. Also, I wanted to acknowledge all of what I, you know, what was fact and what was fiction to some extent. But no, that's interesting to hear. So, thank you. All right, and I know we are at time. Thank you both so much oh, for coming out. Thank you, out today. Taylor. That thank was you. a great, great interview. Thank you.